Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome again to Christ Alive Christian Center's Wednesday Night Bible Study. It is such an honor and a privilege to be before you. I discount it joy to be able to teach the word. I discount it a joy that God says, Anissa, you can be trusted with my anointing and you can be trusted to speak to my people. Yes, you are God's people and I'm just a servant and I'm just awesome and I'm just privileged and I just feel honored that he considers me to be a worthy vessel to deliver word to his people. It's not something that I take lightly. I am truly, truly humbled and truly, truly honored to be before you. And I also want to thank our pastors, Pastor Dean and Deborah Brown, for allowing me to even stand here and deliver the word. I can't even express to you the joy that fills my heart to be in this position. So I thank you for tuning in and for listening and for just being here. And I hope and I pray and I believe that the words that are being delivered, not only from me, but from the rest of the individuals here at Christ Alive Christian Center, has not only um, blessed you, but impacted your life and changed you in ways that only God can do. So with that being said, um, my name is Dr. Anissa Riley, and let's pray and let's get into the word tonight for Bible study. Father, we just praise you and thank you for this awesome opportunity to come before you. You are the one true God, the maker of the heaven and the universe. And we just say thank you, Father, for allowing us to partner with you. Lord, I thank you for allowing the Holy Spirit to think through my thoughts, speak through my lips, and deliver a word that you have downloaded into me from heaven, Father. I thank you that the word that will come forth will be a life-changing word, will hook up to everyone's spirit that is listening and open and ready to receive and produce a harvest that will not only be something that they can say God is real, but those that they have influence around and in, that are in their sphere of influence will also see that you are real and say yes to you and your way and what your son has done for us. Father, I thank you again, and I thank you for blessing this word. In Jesus' name, amen. So welcome back, welcome back. Last week, we started talking about being a kingdom thinker, and I encourage you to go back and look at that message, really take some notes, listen to it more and more, more than one time, to re-listen to it, because I'm sure that there are nuggets in there that you will hear on when you repeat it. You know, when you do things in repetition, you hear something like before. And proof is, I know when I read the Bible, and I've read the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, but each time that I do that, I see something new. I learn something new. I'm like, really? That was always in the Bible? Even 10 years later, I'm like, that was there? So I encourage you to go back and listen to that message on kingdom thinking, um, because I'm sure you will have the same um, effect that I just described. So well, this is part two. This is going to be called Kingdom Thinking, the Enemy's Devices. So I want you to think about that. Kingdom Thinking, the Enemy's Devices. And um, as I am teaching, remember, I always share that there are two teachings. The one that I'm teaching, that is for the entire population that is listening, and then the teaching that comes from the Holy Spirit that is specifically designed for you, your purpose, your destiny, and the race that you are running. So pay attention to both of them because the lessons that the Holy Spirit will give you is to strengthen your walk in Christ. And it may be a word that you need to hold on to because you're going to come in contact with someone who needs the word because they didn't see this replay, they didn't watch this video, they didn't see this, but you have the word because God knows who you're about to come in contact with, so pay close attention. So as I said, this is called Kingdom Thinking, and that title, that um, message last week was grounded in Matthew 6, 25 through 33, where we talked about not worrying and thinking making sure that our thoughts are dominated by God. And it said, if your thoughts are dominated by what shall you wear, what shall you eat, what shall you drink, or your life, then you are an unbeliever. 
And we don't want to be in that place or position or be considered an unbeliever. We want to make sure that we are not being influenced by the ideals and opinions of culture. We want to make sure that we are not operating through the wisdom of the world, but we want to make sure that we are constantly seeking the kingdom. And I shared some nuggets about how you can do that. Now, I'm sure between last week and this week, there were things that came against you to really challenge your ability to constantly think or have your thoughts dominated by the kingdom. And so this week, I really want us to delve into what we need to be aware of as we are traveling this road, as we are becoming very intentional about ensuring that our thoughts are in alignment with God's thoughts, okay? So we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to read from the New King James Version. And we're going to start at verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, let's go back to verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. So this is um, Paul writing, and he's just writing to the church of Corinth. And he says, when whom you forgive, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Right? And he's talking about, you know, we have to be very mindful of forgiveness because things can happen when you are not in that state of forgiveness. Verse 11 is the verse... I mean, yeah, verse 11 is the verse that I want us to focus on. It says, lest Satan should take advantage of us. So when you're operating that, there's an opportunity for Satan to take advantage of you. And then it says, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You hear that? For we are not ignorant of his devices. So that implies that we can be ignorant of Satan's devices. If we are not purposeful, if we are not intentional, if we are not um, in the mind state of constantly being aware, we can be ignorant of Satan's devices. And so when we are ignorant of Satan's devices, then things can occur. And I want to unpack Satan's devices today. He doesn't do anything different. He is the same he does the same things. He, as, the, as Jesus said, has lied from the beginning. And so what he's doing is the same. What he tries to do is deceive you. Think something new is happening. But we know in Ecclesiastes, it says there's nothing new under the sun. It just may come in a different package. It may look differently, but it's not new. And the more we are aware and the more we are cognizant of Satan's devices, then the more we are able to put them away under our feet and be intentional about keeping our mind focused on God's way of doing things. So the Bible always, when you're studying the Bible, it talks about the law of first mention, right? And so what that means is the first way it showed up in the Bible is the actual foundation or is the way that it is supposed to occur. So Let's kind of go to this place where the law of first mention comes into play. So we're going to go to Genesis. That's the beginning. We're going to go to Genesis. I read this last week, but for the purpose of today, we're going to read it again because this is going to set the foundation of us understanding Satan's devices. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. So we see the Satan, the serpent, showing up. So let's talk. It says, the serpent was the shrewdest, the shrewdest of all the wild, wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. 
it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it and you will be like God. Knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Okay, so there are so much to unpack in these seven verses. And remember, I just said the law of first mention. So what were some of the devices that we see in this that the enemy used and that I want you to become aware of? So that way, when he shows up, you can say, ha ha, oh no, you won't, not today, Satan. So here we go. So the first thing is that the enemy likes to mess with your focus. He likes to get you distracted, messing with your focus. So let's see right here. It says in verse one, did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? Now. Before then, it doesn't appear in the scriptures before that they weren't focused on the tree, on that tree. They were focused on everything else that they could eat. They could eat from this tree. They could tend the garden because that was their instructions. So now all of a sudden, he says, did God really say you must not eat from the tree, from any of the trees in the garden? And she's like, of course we can. You know, it's. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. She wasn't thinking about that tree. But as soon as he said it, and you go down to verse 6, it says that she, she, she saw that the tree was beautiful. Was the tree always beautiful? Did all of a sudden the tree become beautiful because her focus was on it? No, the tree was always beautiful. But because Satan introduced something to get her focus on the tree now all of a sudden it was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious but it was always like that but she wasn't focused on that she was focused prior to this on what God told her to do until she entertained a word that was contrary to what God said so the Satan will come to mess with your focus the minute that you are engrossed in something, the minute that you say, I'm going to start my, I'm going to focus on my relationship with God. The minute that you say, I'm going to focus on my business plan. The minute that you say, I'm going to focus on becoming a better me. He comes with something to distract your focus. He comes to mess with you, to get you off track. Distraction. So if you understand that God is singing, do this. If you have set your mind to do something that you know is right for you, I'm not going to mess with her anymore. I'm not going to mess with him anymore. I'm going to block him. I'm going to block her. I'm not going to go on social media. I'm only going to put um, my filters on my social media. Um, with the, what do you call them things? Those little, that helps you make sure that you're not on social media all day. I don't know what it's called. That as soon as I'm going to do that, I'm going to put myself on a budget. When you know you are doing the things that are right for you, here comes the distractions. Here comes the people saying, why you want to do that? Why you go into church? Why you leaving him? Why you want to be with her? Why you want to go to school? Why, why, why? Should you really do that? Isn't that what it says? Do you really need to do all of that? Does it really take all of that? Those are devices that are coming from the enemy to get you off focus. So as soon as it comes, you can say, ha, 
because that's a device of the enemy. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I heard this joke. I don't know if it's appropriate, but it's made me think about it. The Bible says, who's supposed to make the coffee in the household? Hebrews. So he's supposed to make the coffee. Ha ha, that's only my own little personal joke. So I hope that, like, <laughs> but anyway, because it's not a woman supposed to be brewing the coffee. Hebrews it. But anyway, Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start at verse 1. And we're going to read it in the Passion Translation first. Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read to verse 3. It says, as for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has been already marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention and expectation onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. Did you see that? Do you, do you see all of that? In here, it talked about focus and staying focused and not allowing the distractions to interfere with the purpose. We know that Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. There's a song. He came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. So yes, so he came from heaven to earth to show the way. So this right here lets us know the way in which we should deal with distractions, should keep our focus. So it says, verse 2, we look away from the natural realm. Distractions are from the natural. And we focus what? Our attention and expectation onto Jesus. So when these distractions come, when these things come, we focus our attention and expectation, on, expectation onto Jesus who birthed faith in us and who leads us. You're going to follow his lead into faith's perfection. And it says this, his example is this. Listen to this. It says, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing you and I would be his, he endured the agony. So if you believe in God, and that was what I said to you last week, believe in God, and you really believe his promises, go back to Psalm 78 verse 10, if you really believe his promises, then when those distractions come to take away your focus, it won't because your heart will be just like Jesus, knowing with joy that you are going to receive what he said you would receive. Because you, he knew you would be his. Then it goes on to say, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation because he knew that we would be his. And because he did all of that, because he never lost his focus, he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. He got the last laugh. And it says in verse 3, because this, this is not for weak people. You, you can't be weak doing this. It says, so consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls. 
So that means you got to carefully consider what's going on around you so you don't lose your focus. And it says, so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. Life is going to come at you to take away your focus, to distract you. But Jesus understood the joy that we will become his. You have to understand that what he said he would do, he would do. You must really believe that in his promises. Because if you don't, if you don't carefully consider it, you will lose focus and you will cave under life's pressures because those things can wear you down. So that's the first thing. His devices, Satan's devices, will, will mess with your perspective. I mean, mess with your focus. I just told you number two. Those things, his devices, will come to mess with your focus. All right? So now let's go back. The second thing that happened when Satan was talking to Eve is that it made Eve challenge her perspective. He ch will challenge your perspective. He got Eve to rethink what God said. He got Eve to rethink it. Her perspective was, God said we can't eat. Let's go there, because I don't want to misquote. Go, go to Genesis with me again. Go, go to Genesis. Go back there, because I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. Actually, no, we're gonna, I want you to see something, and then we're going to go back to chapter 3. So go to Genesis chapter 2, right? And we're going to read New Living Translation, verse 8 and 9. Right? Because he talks about in verse 8, then the Lord God, this is New Living Translation, Genesis chapter 2, 8. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. You see, it was already delicious. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Now jump down to verse 15. Listen carefully. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat, you may freely eat, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat his fruit, you are sure to die. What did he say? You may freely eat. Now we're talking about Satan's devices, about challenging your perspective. Her perspective was you can't eat of this tree. That's what her, it was. You can't eat of it. You can do it of anything else, but you can't eat of it. Watch this. He, when Satan comes, chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says in the latter half of the verse, he says, one day he asked, this is Satan, one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? You just heard it. You just read it. But did he really say it? Look what she says. Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. Where did she get that from? It said, God said, don't eat from it. And now she, her perspective is, you can't eat it or even touch it. So his device is to come and help you, get you to change your perspective. She was fine in the beginning. She knew not to until he showed up and whispered this in her ear and totally changed her perspective. Her perspective went from, I can't eat it, to I can't eat it or touch it. And then the door started opening that took her down this spiral of, it looked delicious. We read that it already was delicious. And it looked good to eat, pleasing to her eyes. Now, let's, let, I want you to examine something because he comes in different ways. Go to Matthew chapter 14 because we're talking about challenging your perspective. She was doing the right thing. She understood what to do. And then he came to challenge her perspective. 
and she needed to stand strong. So go to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to start at verse 27. Matter of fact, we're going to go to verse, we're going to start, go back up to verse 22. And this is a familiar passage of scriptures to many, and it's about Peter, but let's read it so we can set the stage. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? So we talked about changing, challenging your perspective. One of the devices is the enemy coming to challenge your perspective. And right here, I will dare to say that these winds and these waves challenge Peter's perspective. Because how is it that Peter went from saying, Lord, let me get out the boat. He's walking on water. He's walking on water. Did the waves and the wind already just start when he started walking on the water? No, we read in verse 24, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away. They were in trouble. They were already in trouble far away from the land. And it says, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. So this was already happened. They were already in trouble. They were already in the midst of something. Jesus shows up, Peter puts his perspective on Jesus, he sees him, he says, if it's you, call me, he comes, he's walking on the water, there is still waves, there is still wind, and he was, his perspective was, Jesus said to come, so I'm coming, I'm doing it, and the minute his perspective went from what Jesus said to him to the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. He began to sink. You like if you walk, you can't walk on water and just to begin to sink. Like you just go down fast, right? Verse thirty, he says. But when he saw the strong wind in the waves, so you telling me he didn't see the wind in the waves before he got out the boat? So something happened because I'm no in the boat. He saw the wind in the waves, so he started walking on the water. And then it says, but then, but when he saw them. So he switched his perspective. He went from being focused on Jesus, his perspective on Jesus, to what was going on around. And it says in verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. So he must have been just that close to God that he could have just reached out and grabbed him. Isn't that happen sometimes? We could be right there and, and more pressure comes and we're like, I, I can't do it. And they were like, you just have one, just a little bit more to go. And you just stayed focused, stayed put your perspective, stayed with Jesus. And what does he say? The reason for that, you have so little faith. You doubted Jesus. You became so engrossed in what was going on around you that you didn't believe that Jesus could do what he said. And what do you ask them? Peter asked him, call me to come. He said, come, come on. But when the device that the enemy uses, the wind, the waves, this intense pressure, got him to change his perspective. So the enemy will mess with your focus and he'll get you 
to challenge your perspective. Like, am I really doing this? I'm really walking on water. And then challenge it. Did God really? Are you really walking on water? Did God really say not to eat? Did God really say to tithe? Did God really say to pray? Did God really say to marry this person? Did God really say to move to that town? Because now there's pressure happening. It must not be God. I'm terrified. I'm scared. You lose your faith and you doubt. Did God really say? So if you find yourself in that position, in that predicament where your perspective is being challenged, up, oh, that's a device of the enemy. That's a device of the enemy. And what you need to do is focus on the word, focus on Jesus. Because the minute that Peter looked at someplace else, he began to sink. So, so what's the third thing, one of the third devices that um, will occur that Satan will try to use? The third one is to create isolation. He will do his best to create isolation. And so when you continue to read the story of Adam and Eve, you may know it, you may not know it, but if you get an opportunity, read it if you want to familiarize yourself or re-familiarize yourself with it. Because they did those things, because they um, lost their focus and focused on the tree, and because they allowed their perspective to be challenged, to rethink what God said, God said, you, you can't stay here. Like, you know, separation from God. Like they, they weren't uh, fellowshipping with God like they were before. They weren't in the garden like they were before. There were things that had that occurred that didn't occur before. And so he wants you to have this isolation to get you away from the life-giving source that blesses you. A way to say that is, have you ever been connected to someone who was blessing you, giving you a good word, and then someone comes and be like, why are they always doing that? Why are you going to that church? The church is blessing you. The church is, you know for a fact that ever since you started going to that church, your life has never been the same. You, 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 you feel the joy on the inside. You know that your mind is different. You know what you desire is different. And then because people start seeing you different, they start challenging that. Why are you doing that? They want to take you. They want to create you a place where you're no longer being blessed. And that's what happened to Eve. Because of that, you know, the life was in the garden. The relationship and fellowship was in the garden. And the enemy wants you not to be there. He got kicked out, so he's not, around, he's not allowed to be back. So he wants the same for you and I. Let me give you an example. Turn to Judges. I'm going to go to Judges. Judges. This is, I, I want to say, one of the saddest stories in the Bible. One of the saddest stories in the Bible, just this is my own personal opinion. You may find another story that is sad in the Bible, but I think this is a very, very sad story. It's the story of Samson and Delilah. And Samson, you know, was very strong. His strength came in his hair and he allowed his focus to be um, messed with. Um, he allowed his perspective to be messed with by dealing with Delilah, and uh, she got him real good. She got him good. She got him real, real good. To the point where he loses everything, right? He goes blind. He loses his strength. And then we come here. So he, he's isolated. He got into this mess, and now he's isolated. Did stuff he wasn't supposed to. He wasn't supposed to be messing with these type of women, but he did. And now he's isolated. And look what he says. He says, in verse 28, he says, 
Then Samson called the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me. Let's read in the New Living Translation. Let me go over verse 28 in the New Living Translation. Verse 28. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Now, why would he have to start off the prayer by saying, remember me again? Because he was removed from his life-giving force. Because he did all these things, he fell into the trap that enemy has set for him through Delilah. Remember me. And it says, oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. So he lost his strength by being isolated. And that's what the enemy wants, you to lose your strength. And he asks, with one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. He wanted revenge. And I'm not saying that you do all that stuff. No, I'm not saying that because God says vengeance is mine. You know, the battle is his. But because um, Samson did what he did and, and his focus was messed up and his perspective and he, you know, got into this uh, stuff, he asked for this. And then it says in verse 29, then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple, pushing against them with both hands. He prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifeline, lifetime. So because he got into this place of getting away from his life-given source, from his strength, he lost his sight and he was like, let me die with them. Like, is that what you want to do? Die on the hill? That's what they say. Die on the hill. I'm going to die on the hill. But you don't have to do all of that. But that's what the enemy comes to do to create this isolation, to get you away from your life-giving source, to get you away from the people who bless you, to get you away from the things that give you strength. And then when you find yourself with that predicament, you start praying, Lord, forgive me. But there's a consequence. And you don't have to go through all of that. If you are fully aware of the enemy's devices. Now, as I begin to wrap up, I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Right? And I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. Ephesians chapter 6. Because we talked about becoming aware of the enemy's devices. And the enemy, we can't see him, so we know this is spiritual. And when you look at Ephesians chapter 6, and you start at verse 10, in the Passion Translation, this passage of Scripture is called spiritual warfare. So the enemy is coming in the spirit to fight you. So we need to understand that focus is spiritual. Perspective is spiritual and isolation is spiritual, right? This is what he wants to do. He wants you to get you away from your life-giving force. So this passage of scripture starts, says spiritual warfare. And verse 12, that's what we're going to read. It says, your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they, are power, for they are a powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Do you see that? Yeah, so it's not the people. It's not the people. He, he'll use people, but it's not the people. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat, what you're going through, the devices, are not with the people. These are not with human beings, but with the highest. Why do you think they put this word, the highest principalities and authorities operating in a rebellion. We're not talking about the corner boys. We're not talking about the aides. We're not talking about the servants. We're not talking about the errand boys. We're talking about the highest principalities. So Satan is using the highest class of demon gods. It says the powerful class of demon gods and evil spirits. To get you to lose your focus, challenge your perspective, and create isolation. So if he is putting that much energy into this fight and to get you off course, then what does it say in verse 13? Because of this, 
because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides you. So you protect it as you confront the slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. It says you're protected as you confront. So you have to confront the enemy. You have to know his devices. You have to be able to stand up. And it says, this is the guarantee, believe the word, believe God. It says, you are destined for all things. Last week I talked about all these things will be added unto you, what you shall wear, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, what you shall wear. You are destined for all things. And it says, and will rise victorious. Remember, I just read the scripture that says, do not cave under life's pressures. Do not give in. Do not be worn out. Don't do it. Because when you put on the full armor of God, when you understand Satan's devices, when you operate as God says and understand that this is not hand-to-hand -hand combat, you're not fighting people, you fight in a powerful class of demon gods, you will rise victorious. So this is what kingdom thinking is about. This is being a kingdom thinker, strategic. When you're in warfare, they just don't go out and just fight. There's a strategy that happens way before they get on a battlefield. So every morning, put on your full armor. Every morning, make sure that you are prayed up. Every morning, make sure you have word and scripture and you understand and you don't move unless the king tells you what to do. That is how you fight this battle because you need to confront the slanderer. You need to make sure that you have your, your faith is built up. You need to make sure that you know this word. And you need to make sure that you know the devices. In battle, you know how the enemy moves, just like that. When they play in sports, they study the other team. They watch the tape. In boxing, they watch, oh, you know what? When he ducks like this, he's about to throw a right. When he moves like this, he's about to throw an uppercut. They study so that they know how to combat it. They are aware of how their opponent is moving. And so, remember, the enemy walks about roaring like a lion. He's not a lion, it's like a lion. But if you don't know, you'll be deceived and you'll, your focus will be messed up, your perspective will be off, and you'll be isolated. So as we wrap up, be a kingdom thinker. Be mindful of the enemy's devices. So that way, you will rise victorious. Because, as it says, you are destined for all things. Amen and amen. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to understand who we are. We understand that you have given us all that we need in order to confront the slanderer. You have given us all that we need to maintain our focus, keep our perspective, and be in right communion with you. We will not allow ourselves to be separated from your life-giving force. We will not allow our focus to be messed with. We will not allow our perspective to be challenged, but we will stay on you. We will keep our eyes on you because you give us our help. We will look our eyes into the hills from whence cometh our help. You told us, Father, that if we put on the full armor of God, we will be protected. And when we confront the slanderer, we will have all things and we will rise victorious. We really believe you. We honor that. And we make sure that our faith is strong and we continue to feed our faith. Father, we thank you because you do all things well. And we are in your presence and we receive it all. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. If you are trying to figure out how you can become in this life, and if you, can figure, if you want to know how to make sure that Jesus is in your heart so that way that you don't lose your focus, you don't, your perspective is not challenged, and, and, and you understand that you want to be connected to this life-giving force, it's simple. You just ask Jesus to come into your heart. It, all you have to do is say, Lord, you are the Lord of my life. There's a simple, quick prayer. It's not simple. It's simple in the natural sense, in the worldly sense, but it is the most powerful thing you could ever do. It is the best decision that you can ever make. 
And the minute that you ask Jesus into your life, into your heart, into your mind, into your soul, then those devices that have been messing with you, those thoughts that you've been having, those fears that you have at night, God will protect you. Because it says, everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But just like we read that he adored the cross because he had the joy of knowing you are his. That's what happens. So repeat after me. If you know that this is the decision that you need to make in order to change your life. Repeat after me. Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and to take all of my sin all of my wrongdoing, all of my fears, all of my sicknesses, and nailed it to the cross. He did it for me. He came to earth to show me the way. And now I see that it is done. I thank you for this life that you have provided for me through him. I believe it, I receive it. Jesus, you are Lord. Amen. If you've just given your life, there's a information on the screen. Please contact us. We want to make sure that we, you not only understand the decision, completely understand the decision that you made, but make sure that you are constantly supported. If you don't have a church home, I invite you to come to Christ Alive Christian Center right here in the Bronx. But more so, wherever you are, you need to get connected to a church because remember, the winds will blow, the waves will come, the enemy is now going to put the pressure on even more. And you need to be in community. You don't want to be isolated. Remember, one of his devices is to create isolation. So don't isolate yourself because the joy is yours. So make sure that you contact us. If you need help finding a local church, we will also do that if you are not in this area and can't get here. But God has his people everywhere and there is some place that you can be and go. So if you just um, said the prayer, welcome to the family of God. It is the best decision that you could have made. It's the best decision that I could have ever made. It's taken me from all of the trauma that I've experienced and created so much joy in my life and in my heart. And all I want you to know is that you can have it too. And so welcome, welcome, welcome. It is an honor and a privilege to be here to give you that opportunity and you accept it. That's how great the Holy Spirit is. That's how great God is. That's how great this whole life is. Because understand, this is my life for the rest of my life. No cap. For real. Amen and amen and amen and amen. Oh, Jesus, you are amazing. So we're going to take a break. We're going to have some announcements. And then I'll be right back.
So, you saw all of those announcements. We have a lot going on. So, like I said, if you need a local church, you need to find a church, come on here, get involved, and come say hi to me because I'm, I'm here like every Sunday. Uh, but there's other people that you can come and meet and say hi to. And so I invite you to come on out. Um, as we begin to wrap up, we're now going to continue to worship the Lord with our giving. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of the kingdom of God by offering our finances, giving back to God um, what he has given us because he owns everything and he allows us to partner with him to steward over the finances that he has placed into our lives. And so it's an honor to do that. And so as we engage in worship right now through giving, I invite you to either use the app, the church app. Um, I invite you to text. The number should be on your screen or um, you can use an envelope and mail it in. But whatever you do, you do it from a place of joy, a place of um, giving, a place of love, um, because as you do, it is a testament to God that you believe he is real. It's a constant affirmation that, yes, God, I really do believe you. Amen. And I thank you for giving your life. Just like we read, he endured the shame because he knew we would be his. So I give you everything, God. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you for this opportunity to partner with you. We thank you that as we put our faith out and give our finances, that we really believe that you will give it back to us. You will open up the windows and pour us our blessings because you want us to live in abundance. Because it's living in that abundance that is your glory. And it is your glory that attracts people. So we want to be the um, attracting more people to you. We want to make sure that we are snatching as many people as we can from hell, Lord God. So this, this, this offering, what we're giving is part of that work. Thank you for allowing me, be to, me to be an aroma of a life. And as I continue to do this, I'm going to smell even more and more like a life so people can know that they can have a life and have it more abundantly. In Jesus' name, and, every, and everybody said, amen. Well, thank you once again for spending time with us. It's an honor and a privilege, like I've always said, to teach the word. And I thank you for sharing this message and for getting it out, for being um, um, YouTube, Facebook, wherever you see this evangelist by sharing it. However you do this, you sharing it is evangelizing. So thank you for doing that. And with that being said, as our pastor always says, without expectation, there can be no manifestation because your expectation is your faith in action. Good night.